From the New York Times Learning Network, welcome to Writing for Podcasts. I'm Ross Flatt, Professional Development Manager. You know, most of the time when we're sharing different ways that students and teachers can learn and teach with the New York Times, we're talking about our written features, like our news articles, our editorials, infographics, or reviews. But the New York Times does so much more. And one of the features we've developed considerably over the past several years has been our podcasts. So if you're like me and you start every day with with a cup of coffee, listening to The Daily, or you want to know what is your next book you should add to your must-read list by listening to the book review, or you want to go in-depth with one of our limited podcasts, such as Nice White Parents, Whatever the genre, format, or topic, there's something for everybody. And that's what our Unit 6 in our writing curriculum is really all about. In Unit 6, Writing for Podcasts, we walk teachers and students through how to create their own podcasts. We offer writing prompts to brainstorm topic possibilities. You can listen to teen-created mentor texts and try some of the podcasting moves we spotlight in a step-by-step lesson. You can understand the artistic and technical details of creating great podcasts with help from our lesson plans, such as Project Audio. And of course, you can learn how to enter our podcast contest. So in today's webinar, we're going to walk through our student podcast contest and the resources that accompany it. We'll discuss different elements that make for effective podcasts, from picking a topic all the way to editing and publishing and we'll analyze student podcasts for ideas that will help you get your students podcasting right away. Joining us today to talk about this will be Callie Holterman, Senior News Assistant at The Learning Network, and Laura Winnick, Librarian at The Blue School in New York City. So we're going to learn a little bit more about the Student Podcast Contest, and I'm gonna ask Callie to join us. So Callie, welcome to today's webinar. Hey Ross, it's great to be here. I'm excited to talk more about the contest. All right, so can you tell us a little bit about just, you know, what the contest is, what are the rules, and what should teachers and students think about as they're entering? Absolutely. So it's always a really good time to be working with podcasting in the classroom, but this spring is an especially good time because we're running our fourth annual student podcast contest at the Learning Network. And in this contest, we invite middle and high schoolers to create their own podcasts on any topic in any format as long as they're under five minutes that inform or entertain us in some way. And then a team from the New York Times and from the Learning Network will listen to all of those podcasts and publish a post with some of the winners. There are a few rules that are helpful to know about before you dive into entering this podcast contest with your students. First of all, the podcast has to be original. So if your student has already made an amazing podcast that aired on a local radio station, we love it, but we want them to create one that is brand new for this contest. Um, And podcasts can be in any format or genre. So if your students love listening to uh, like a news show or an interview show, or if they prefer listening to true crime or fiction podcasts, that's all fair game. Really any format or genre that appeals to your students, we're excited to hear it. The eligibility for the contest is middle and high school students, so ages 11 to 19, anywhere in the world. And students can work together on this contest. You could have two students create a conversational podcast together, but we ask that uh, students only submit one entry per person. And finally, I said this before, but it's worth stressing. Podcasts should be five minutes or less. If they're longer than five minutes, we can't consider them just because there are a lot to listen to. So those are sort of the hard and fast rules. Um, But a lot of students want to know what they can do to make sure that their podcast stands out as we're judging. So this is the rubric that our judges kind of have in mind as we're listening. First of all, we want the content to be interesting and we want it to have a point in some way. So any podcasting format works, but we hope that it can either entertain or inform listeners and that the listener leaves maybe knowing something or having explored a subject that they might not have thought hard about before or has been exposed to new perspectives on a topic they're already familiar with. For flow, we know that these podcasts are short, but it's still possible to have sort of a narrative arc, a beginning, middle, and ending. And we're gonna give some examples of how past student winners have done that in this webinar. 
we do consider editing as a part of the judging process. And that doesn't mean we're looking for a professionally edited podcast, but we're hoping that students have been thoughtful and intentional about how they can bring in music or sound effects or multiple voices in order to sort of get their story across in a podcast. And finally, we just remind you to just definitely read through those guidelines with your students prior to submitting. We also sometimes get questions about, you know, what's what's the right subject for this? Or students will think I need to tackle, you know, just a gigantic topic in order for my podcast to stand out. And that's not really the case. Students have created winning podcasts in all sorts of formats on all sorts of issues that really matter to them. And you can see some of those on the screen now. There are tons of them. Some examples of students spoke about their experience living through the coronavirus pandemic. The eight o'clock howl is a good example of that. Some students took on really narrow subjects that were personal to them, like canned expression, which is about graffiti art, and others do take on those really big issues, but from a student's perspective. So our generation, our climate is another example of that. And again, if you do work with this contest, listening to past student examples is a great way to get into it yourself and get your students into it. And we'll be talking through some of those throughout the rest of the webinar. Thanks so much, Callie. And now we'd like, we're going to hear from some of our past student winners of our podcast contest. So we spoke to these students a little bit ago, Fanny, Daniel, Ari, and Ian, and they're going to tell you a little bit about some of their uh, methods for, um, for going about podcasting and, and what this contest meant. So let's take a look and a listen. Before writing, there was only oral story storytelling. And there's something kind of uh, comforting. So there's something kind of interesting about people being so drawn to hearing other people talk. When I was trying to like brainstorm and figure out a topic, um, I spoke to my dad. And I was like, well, I don't want it to be like too casual. No one wants to just hear me talk about like, whatever I want to talk about. And he's like, that's a podcast. Like, talk about something that people your age are going to want to hear about. I mean, it's a bit cliche, but I feel like the most important thing that me and Daniel had going through the entire process was like an authentic interest and uh, a feeling of authenticity throughout you know, the entire piece. First thing we did is that we laid out a theme. What message are we trying to send? And um, then we worked with creating a you know, beginning, middle, and what exactly are we trying to say in each, you know, segment of our podcast? And what are we trying to accomplish within each segment? So I spent a little bit of time thinking about what format I wanted my podcast to be. But once I decided on the subject matter, I thought that a narrative would be the most personal way to kind of bring my story to life. It just started taking on a really long narrative form. I was just typing and going with the flow and typing a lot. And then I went back and read over and decided what I thought I should keep, what maybe wasn't necessary. And from that original like big chunk of information, I just kept fine tuning it. As far as my structure, I had like maybe three questions that I really wanted to hit that were kind of like um, how how you dated, the stages, and then the differences. And that was kind of like my beginning, middle, end, but it got a lot more structured as I edited it because I kind of did it in the way that the conversation flowed. So we wanted to um, sort of have this spacey theme and like a um, historical vibe to the whole podcast. And that's why we incorporated parts from um, old, old radio announcements that was um, that was part of the history and so that's that that was our choice to be able to incorporate small like old-timey um, tunes into the podcast while weaving in the story and we really wanted to bring um, the listeners on a journey I like writing I find it just a generally rewarding experience even if I'm just writing for myself but make, putting it into a podcast and then having other people listen to that podcast, and it was a rewarding experience. It was great to see that people think what I have to say matters.
So let's dive into this a little bit more. I'm going to uh, welcome back Laura Winnick. Uh, Laura joined us uh, for a podcasting webinar before. So Laura, welcome back to the Learning Network. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, Laura, you've done podcasting in your in your classroom many times before. So can you just tell us how did you come to podcasting and what does it offer to students and teachers? Sure. I came to podcasting when I was an English teacher and I was working specifically with second semester seniors, um, a group of students notoriously difficult to engage. I really wanted to make sure these students were equipped with the research skills they needed for college. Essentially asking questions, choosing credible and relevant sources, summarizing text, developing a thesis, writing with evidence. I wanted the research process to be a process where my students were engaged and driven by real world investigation and essentially to have an authentic audience. I realized really quickly that podcasts were a creative container for the traditional research paper. They ask students to ask questions, right? They invite students to ask questions, to find sources, sometimes literally going after the source themselves, right? Tweeting at a journalist, getting the journalist on the phone, talking to them. They invite students to summarize and develop an idea or an answer to the question they were pursuing always in their own words, um, with their own language and recording their actual voices. So instead of submitting a 10 to 20 page research paper to just be read by me, their English teacher, uh, when students created podcasts in my classes, what we had were actual artifacts that published actual student voices and then could be shared with an audience outside of the classroom. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I can absolutely uh, relate to the need to give students you know, like a, a need to know, a reason to want to learn and uncover something. And this is a really great marriage of skills and knowledge, I think, at any grade level. Today, what we're going to talk about is just how you can go about creating a podcast from soup to nuts. So we're going to talk about choosing a topic and also deciding on a format. And you'll notice that these two uh, are, are a little interchangeable, and Laura's going to talk about why. We are also going to talk about how to conduct research, how to create an outline, of course, writing the script, and then finally recording, editing, and publishing your podcast. So let's get started with choosing a topic and deciding on a format. So before we unpack this a little bit, we're going to hear from a producer from New York Times Opinion Audio, uh, Phoebe Lett. Phoebe uh, works on the argument, and she talked to me about what makes a great podcast, and it has a lot to do with formatting and topics. Let's listen. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I think a lot about what makes a great podcast. First of all, that's very subjective. So whatever you think makes a great podcast is what makes a great podcast to you. And you should try emulating that. Is it the way that the host makes you feel like you're at a table with them? Is it the funny banter between the co-hosts? If um, you can isolate what parts of it you are enjoying, then you can start to see patterns in your listening. Like, oh, I only gravitate toward shows that are history explainers, it seems. And these are really good ones. Figure out why. There's a few things that makes a, a good podcast across all genres and formats. This is, again, subjective, but in my opinion, podcasts that have a point. So podcasts that you open them up and the host says, we talk about everything. That for me is a little bit too broad. Um, and if I really love that person, I will listen. But if you want a broader audience, if you want to attract new listeners, then it's really good to have a point that you're trying to make in the show or in the episode. Um, whether that's, we're going to talk about a new video game every week, or we're going to talk about um, times that we, uh, met a dog. It could be anything. But if if I know as a listener and I'm told in the introduction that I'm going to hear this, this, and this, I feel like, okay, there's a point. I get to decide if it's worth my while. And um, if it sounds like something I'm interested in, I'll stick around. If I don't get that at the top, 
and it just seems like it's kind of rambling and ranting and they're just talking about their weekend and whatever, and I don't already love these people, I'm going to tune away. All right. So the big message there, have a point, which to me sounds a lot like have a clear topic, uh, maybe have a have a clear format. So, Laura, uh, how can we get students started with this? What's what steps do you take? Yeah, again, there are these two avenues for doing this, and sometimes they happen at the same time uh, for a student. So one road to doing this to be you know, inspiring students, getting them to think about the possibility of creating an audio narrative um, is sh leading with genre, leading with all of these different formats. Um, there's so many different types of podcasts out there. And I think that it's important. Um, I think that although students um, are really familiar in the audio and visual and video editing world. Um, they are less familiar and um, immersed in the world of podcasting than adults. So in my experience, and kids are like, yeah, I've, I've heard of a podcast before. It's like the radio, but they don't have actual podcasts that they listen to. Um, and then when I talk to adults, usually a lot of us, as we're all saying in the group chat, have favorite podcasts that we go back to every day or every single week. So introduce your students to this um, project by opening up and showing clips of different genres. So you have informational reporting, long form interviews, conversation, solo cast, podcast theater. Um, I really loved what the student winner Ari said of like, no one wants to just hear me talk, right? Uh, and then her parent was responding, no, that's a podcast. Um, and the truth is human voices are very compelling, um, especially human voices that are driven by inquiry. Um, so use mentor texts when you are leading through this avenue. You're showing many different examples. Um, you're letting kids pick and like really um, be honest and saying, you know, because it was a conversation, I stopped paying attention. But because or because there was this reporting and it was um, there were so many cuts of different voices. I heard different um, environments. Um, I felt like I was in different places that kept me attentive. Um, open that up and let students say what they like the best and offer them the whole, uh, the real, the world of different types of podcasts. The other avenue to kind of initiating this project with students is thinking about topics. Um, and again, sometimes these, these two things are happening at the same time. So when you uh, play an example of a conversational podcast, you'll see that a student realizes they've got great banter with a best friend, great banter with a grandma. They'll say, oh, my grandma and I always talk about canned food. We love to talk about that. We don't know why canned food exists. We love, or we love to eat it. We hate to eat it. Whatever, right? So, so sometimes the topic comes from you know. Again, they're 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 intertwined in this way. Um, there are so many different range of topics that you can explore via podcast. There's no limit, um, but there are ways. I think as educators, we often want to you know anchor ourselves. We don't want to say this is limitless. There's a million trillion ideas. So you know one. One opportunity or resource to use is the Learning Network's lists of topics or, or writing projects. They've got tons of lists and questions. Um, I also think that, you know, in my experience, usually when I'm doing podcasts, they are often grounded in experience or a text that so it's related to a book we're reading in class and then the thematic kind of spin-offs are always related to the framework of the book or um, experience I mean um, looking at students and saying podcasts are an opportunity for you to share and share vulnerably and what are you experiencing right now um, so letting the student be the expert on their life what I love about this type of project is it is very student voice driven. There's lots of there's lots of choice that they can gravitate towards, um, and y we can see that in all of these student examples. Now, Laura mentioned that if you're interested in getting your students to think about a type of topic they might be interested in, you can check out Learning Network prompts. And I'm just going to throw a couple on the screen that we have in our unit six curriculum. So for example, uh, one could be a student opinion on who do you think has been overlooked by history? 
having a student just write about this at first might be able to kind of shake a few things and, and get them thinking um, about maybe a history podcast they want to do. Or another student opinion is, is it harder to grow up in the 21st century than it was in the past? Think about the podcast that Ari was talking about that she did with her parents. Or maybe what have you learned from animals? Or even are you the same person on social media as you are in real life? So again, none of these are meant to get students writing for podcasts, but you can see how by doing these writing prompts, it can really get students and teachers thinking and talking and figuring out what they want to podcast about. So let's do that. We're going to listen to our first clip from a student podcast, Opening the Blinds by Megan Vaz. And as you listen, we'd like you to tell us, what do you notice about this podcast generally? What format is this podcast? And why do you think this student chose this format? So again, let's listen and we'll come right back. Share your thoughts in the chat. Around 6 p.m. every day, I lug my mother onto a nature walk. We cross the street from our little condo apartment, trampling past our neighbor's backyard into the golf course ridden with ponds and trails beyond. I snap pictures of every species I could possibly distinguish and upload them onto iNaturalist, where ecologists and other users can ID them. I'm up to 89 species now, and I guiltlessly flood my bio class feed with pictures of cabbage palms and malalukas and turtles. To me, it's beautiful here, but it wasn't always. In our little South Florida ecosystem, the chirps of northern mockingbirds, boat-tailed grackles, and palm warblers have woken me up every day for the past two months. I'm supposed to be in my dorm at my boarding school right now, but the COVID-19 pandemic has given me an extended stay at home. The birds are a nice change from the slamming doors the shuffling footsteps, the quiet smacks I'd hear before. Before my walks, and to be fair, my Lexapro prescription, I'd lie awake each night in the year 2011. Back then, my mother and brother and I would lie huddled in our bed, praying decades of the rosary over and over again each night. When the prayers were over, there was nothing left to protect me from my father. He was in every tiny creak of the AC I'd hear. He lurked behind every door in the apartment with a shotgun, like he did when I was five. Even after the police found him OD'd in a motel lobby and locked him up, I'd hear him in the thumping of our pet rabbit in fifth grade. PTSD in kids who have experienced domestic violence isn't uncommon, but every aspect of life at home brought me back into a world of abuse where I felt infinitely alone. Laura, any reactions to this example and how are our participants doing? Did they get it right? Yeah, they're doing great. Um, and this is a phenomenal example, I think, of a solo cast. Um, this student uh, really emphasizes her descriptive writing with so many sound effects. And we move from sound effects from the natural world to sound effects to this internal uh, domestic world. Um, that, And then we get the sound effects of that kind of um, enhance these feelings of um, neglect and feelings of abuse and feelings of trauma and feelings of isolation um, and that like emotional layering of all of those sounds is just phenomenal um, and it's I think what is really important about this podcast is that this student uses in an expert way place-based sounds to emphasize a story about home and the domestic sphere um, so she's written something that's true and vulnerable and then when she layers in um all of those aspects we're we're really with her in her immediate world so what we're going to do now is learn a little bit more about how students can conduct research when they're preparing to to create a podcast so first we're going to hear from a, another new york times producer allison bruzek is the senior producer on the Argument podcast, and she's going to talk about what she does as a producer to prepare for a podcast. So let's take another look and a listen. 
So my job as a producer is to put together our podcast called The Argument every week. So we are a weekly show. We come out every Wednesday and we host a wide variety of debates and conversations about the big issues that are happening and that people are talking about in our society right now. So my job is to help prepare our host, Jane Coaston, to know what to talk about. Um, I help find research and help the other producers gather research. For the day to day for producers, so much of the job is in booking and finding the perfect people. So you have to find people who really have like a great story to tell or have a very persuasive argument and they're good at laying that out in a way that's very clear and easy to understand for a lot of people. So that's like the number one thing that we have to do is find the perfect guest. And then once you have the perfect guest, you have to give them a pre-interview is what we call it, or a pre-call, which is where you get them on the phone and you say, okay, tell me as if I'm the host of the podcast, what your argument is or what you want to say or, you know, whatever your case is. And then they'll tell you, and then you'll get a good idea of, okay, like this person is really good at explaining this to me, or like, uh, this person is like not as good as explaining as I thought they would be. So once you know that, then you can actually start scripting, which is the other hard part. Allison's going to speak to us about scripting in just a little bit, but let's talk about research. So Laura, what can students do to research and prepare for their podcast? You know, research when when preparing for research paper involves looking at printed sources. Essentially, research when preparing for a podcast project uh, involves talking to actual people. Um, and I think another key component of a podcast project that I love is that students quickly realize that when they settle on their topic, um, sometimes it turns out that the experts are people who are in their own homes. So perhaps they don't need to talk to someone who works at a fancy museum. Perhaps they just have a few questions about their life or their upbringing or their family. Um, and of course, we know that those experts are are the parents and siblings and grandmas all around. Um, so in terms of researching and preparation, you need to make sure you're only asking a few questions and you're doing a very short, pointed interview. So this is really important. Um, when students are researching and preparing, perhaps they're writing 10 questions, getting feedback from a peer, getting feedback from you. Um, together, you're whittling down to make sure they're clear. What's the exact essence that I want to distill, right? What am I really, where's the meat of this topic and how will those questions bring me to that? So once students have really uh, gathered all of this, all of this research, I don't think it's time to just, you know, start podcasting just yet. It sounds like they have to organize all of their thinking. So let's talk about creating an outline. What do we need to know about podcast outlines, Laura? Yeah, as we get into the actual writing here, we'll see that this is different from um, writing a research paper um, and or even writing a traditional expository essay um, because the outline and then the script um, are, are different, um, quite different than maybe other research or writing assignments that you have had in your classroom. So when I think about a podcast outline, I think about um, how it really is just kind of like five to 10 building blocks of your podcast. So it can be pretty summative. You don't need to necessarily explain every part, but you do need the student to start to see the elements of their podcast. So what do they want to include? Who's, what other voices? What are the sound effects they want to include? It's kind of two parts where there's narration or there's people speaking. There's also sound effects, music. Um, you can think about this as an example, but you can also think about doing one where there's like two columns that are next to each other. So you have the sound effects on one side and the components of, of the podcast on the other. Another core part that we really want to encourage in terms of the flow is including an intro and an outro. So an intro is just going to situate the listener where the podcast host is. So this can be someone who's just saying, hey, I'm Laura, I'm coming to you from my office, right? Or perhaps you're saying, um, I'm Laura, I'm in the Blue School Library, or I'm Laura, I'm standing at West 10th right now. 
whatever it is, there's a um, way to initiate and begin and invite the listener in so they know. And then the outro is kind of the same in terms of flow. We want to make sure you end with your voice with a specific flourish. Um, I always encourage, like I tell students, you can, this is your language, right? So students can't necessarily end a paper with peace out, but I let them end a podcast with peace out because it is really important to have authentic student voice. Yeah. Um, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I can, I can hear uh, different podcast openings like that theme song for the daily in my head as you're, as you're talking about that, it brings that reader right in. So, uh, and what we just had on the screen actually was a PDF that should be in your resource guide, uh, that, uh, uh, some of our teachers have used to organize, uh, students thinking and, and getting their podcast together. So why don't we listen to Ari Gibson's podcast, The Evolution of Dating Culture. Now, we've heard a couple in intros, and we're going to hear a few more, but we're going to hear an example of an outro. So we're going to come in around the middle of, of this podcast or middle end of this podcast. And so we're going to jump right into the conversation that she's having with her parents about what it was like to you know uh, date when they were younger. And then we're going to hear her outro. So let's take a listen to the evolution of dating culture. And of course, as you're listening, what do you notice? What podcast moves do you want your students to emulate? Right. You, you didn't give them your phone number if you didn't want them calling your house. You, if you gave them your number, you probably wanted to date them. So you're in school. Oh, ready? You just get no, no, you no, wanted to see if that was someone something. someone in school with yeah. you. You have five classes with them. You're making googly eyes across the room, or you look away. Did you say googly? Yeah. Or you look, you look over and you see them staring at you, and they try to turn really quickly, or whatever, right? There would be something leading up to that um, back then. Whether so it's a school have... or extracurricular activity or whatever, yeah. you knew them before you gave them your number. Sometimes. It could be other instances, like I play basketball. And you, you see go some around game. Yeah. and you yeah. see some of the game, Same or maybe the home game. And away game, and you know, but, you've all, you, you've seen but there would be some, asked. there'd be some connection, or something, because it's a big thing to call somebody and, and try to kind of get all that stuff going. So your mom's absolutely right. I feel like compared to now, the lines are a lot more blurred, like because you message a lot of people. It's not you're only you're not only talking and communicating with someone that you like. So it's like you don't know when the line is crossed. And then you can also go on a date and not have to meet all your. Right. For a lot of people, dating is not dating. exclusivity. Okay. It's just meaning we're dating. But you have to, that depends on who you ask and what Go type of it. There are a lot of differences between our generations. We're going to explore some of these differences in the next couple of episodes. Until then, think about what dating means to you. Thank you. Ari definitely has some great chemistry with her family, but she has this really awesome outro where she has a theme. She gives her, her audience a, some next steps. Uh, it's like we've been listening to this show for years. So really great example of an outro, and it really personalizes the podcast. Okay, so the next part, which is writing the script, and we're going to see just how different this can be depending on what your podcast is. So we're going to take another look and a listen to Allison Bruzek, and she's going to talk to us about how producers go about writing for a podcast. So let's listen to Allison. Podcast scripting is very much about writing for your own voice. Everyone has a different way of speaking. Everyone has different words that they use when they're talking to people, different um, words they lean on even, like um or uh or you know any of those sort of filler words just like everyone's unique and most people i think don't know that that they have a unique speaking pattern until they start to try to write for themselves and you'll see that not everyone can read the same script the same way so you have to write to your own voice we try to write a script that will sound like our host jane but still get the most interesting parts out of the guest so you know, we start with general questions like, what is your stance? Or what do you think of this issue? And then we get more 
specific. So because our show is called The Argument, obviously we get a little bit argumentative. So we want to say, well, what do you think of this position that doesn't agree with your position? And we want to support that with a lot of facts. Our podcasts are pretty rigorously fact-checked, and so we want to give our host as many facts as possible. One of the other things that we use is um, a trick that we learned from a voice coach, her name is Vicki Merrick, and she advises to start your script by saying something like, hey, whoever you're talking to. So like, I might be like, hey, Ross, and then I would say whatever is in my script. And there's something about saying that where you say like, hi, Ross, or hey, Ross, and then you say whatever you're going to say, that it feels like it tricks your brain into thinking like, oh, I'm having a conversation and I'm talking to someone. And so then it sounds like completely natural. You really need to listen to your voice. So like you have to record it and then it's incredibly painful, but you have to listen to it. <laughs> but like even the professionals, you do, you just do retakes, we call them. You do more takes than you need. Laura, what do students need to put together a good podcast script? So I want to start off by letting teachers know that I think a podcast script is different um, than any other kind of writing you're going to do in your classroom, unless you're maybe scripting a commercial or scripting something performative. A podcast script is is almost an amalgamation of many different things. Um, great one from the daily that we're seeing. Um, you can see the the way it's like cut and pasted, right? Um, it's collaged together um, so that someone, you know, the podcast host is speaking, then you're incorporating other audio into it. The script will involve the intro, the outro. It'll involve any other voices, transcription of those voices. It'll involve sound effects, music. It can also involve transitions. I just also want to say that no two scripts are the same. A long form interview is going to look very different from a personal narration. All of these do require scripts. It's really important to emphasize, you know, how scripts um it are almost like you, you're incorporating everything you've done. The research, thinking about your intro, the branding, the connection, the sound effects, the music, and that's where it all comes together in a script. Yeah, and, and even the one we saw from the argument that Allison shared us, it was literally just questions because most of that show is just two people arguing about a topic they're very well informed on, but the, but the host needs to know what to ask and how to transition. Okay, so... We're going to go to step six, seven, and eight, which is record, edit, and publish. So we're going to hear from another podcasting expert, but this time it's from a student. This student, Daniel Wang, we met him a little bit earlier before, is going to talk, talk to us about how to record and edit a podcast. So let's listen to let's listen to what Daniel has to say. And of course, you can share any tips that you hear in the group chat. Podcasting at first might seem really daunting, but it's actually super easy. My name is Daniel. In 2020, I was the winner of the New York Times podcast contest. And now I'm trying to help teachers and students bring podcasting into their own classrooms. Equipment wise, there's not a lot of, um, you know, fancy materials that you have to get started with the podcast and anyone can pretty much just jump right in. I think uh, a smartphone with any voice memo app or any app that allows you to record MP3 files or a computer with Audacity or GarageBand or pretty much any free app that allows you to record audio are perfect um, examples of how simple the equipment um, are to jump into the podcasting. To get a clear recording, I think first you have to do is you have to remove yourself from any distracting sounds or noises around you. And so what I do is I go up to my, to my room with my computer, with my phone or whatever I'm recording with. And so I sit, sit at my desk and what I do is I actually build a pillow fort. And so what that allows me to do is it allows the, the, my voice to not have any echoes if it were to bounce off like a hard wall or a hard surface of any kind. And so I build a small pillow for it and I keep my microphone, whether that be in my phone or in my computer or either an external microphone. What I do is I keep that around six inches away from my mouth and that allows for really clear and crisp audio um, that you would ultimately put into a podcast. So when you have a podcast, sometimes you want a guest 
to um, add their opinion or add their expertise to your podcast episode. And so when you conduct an interview, I'd recommend to use a phone for the call. And if you're talking face to face, you can record it as if you're just having a conversation and have the voice memo app open. Or also, if you were to call the other person on the other end, you can also ask your guest to record their audio um, through a local source, whether that be their phone or their computer. And at the end of the interview, you can ask the guest to send their audio files to you so that that way you have the most crisp and clean audio. After you've recorded all of your audio files and your interviews or whatever you want to have in your podcast, you want to be able to have these MP3 files on hand and you want to edit them into a podcast in the end. And so for editing podcasts, there are so many free options out there. So I usually use Anchor if I were to record on my phone and want to edit on my phone. Um, or I also use Audacity or GarageBand, which are both free options um, if I were to edit on a laptop. So when you're editing, I think that it's important to make note of how many layers of audio you have. So usually I have my first layer of audio being my voice and being my narration. My second layer of audio being a guest or anyone who I have on my podcast. And my third layer of audio being any sound effects that I want to include in my podcast and enhances the message of my podcast. So when you listen to a podcast, more often than not, it's not just purely voices. There's a lot of sound effects, whether that be music or simple like knocks on the door or something like that. And so for example, um, when I listen to a crime podcast, there's usually a suspenseful, mysterious piano sound effect that the narrator adds in to set up his scene that he's describing. And so there's a lot of overlay in between the sound effects and the subtle music and your voices. And all these sound effects add to the development of your podcast and its message. So you can record these um, sound effects locally, whether that be just knocking on a hard surface to mimic the sounds of knocking on a door, or you can also choose these sound effects from an online library. But when, you, when you're choosing sound effects online, I think the first thing you have to make sure is that these sound effects are royalty free and that you can repurpose them in your way so that you don't get into trouble later down the road. After you're done editing your podcast, you probably want to publish it for the whole world to hear. And so through your editing software, you can compile all your tracks into one single audio file, which is your podcast. And once you're ready, I'd head to soundcloud.com where you have a spot to upload that audio file. And then after that, you'll get a link where you can just pretty much share it with anyone in the world. I mean, he's he's a pro at this. Uh, love his pillow fort I idea. Anything else we need to know about the technical side of podcasting, Laura? Yeah, I, I want to reassure other educators that your students are experts. I think that's really important to emphasize that um, students know so much and um, are well practiced with audio with music, making music, um, and also editing video. So it's really natural um, for them. So, um, and as displayed by Daniel, like, you know, they can be experts as we heard from him and also can do it very simply. So there are ways to add more technology. You could add a microphone, but all you need is a phone. You can use voice memo app on your phone. You, you can also use other editing tools. Um, you know, if you're using... Uh, MacBooks and you have access to GarageBand, but I want to make a plug for a browser-based audio editing tool called Soundtrap. So this is something that could absolutely work on Chromebooks. For the first 30 days are free, so if you're doing one podcasting project in, your, in a classroom, you can totally use this for the first 30 days for a free use um, software to edit your audio. I really like it because it's really intuitive for students. I mean, all audio editing is, but this one especially, they're um, kind of user interface. And also you can do collaborative projects on it. So um, you can have a couple kids editing the same podcast at the same time, the same as kind of we use Google Docs and we get a bunch of students on one Google Doc. I think that's really helpful. I think that encourages group work. And I think that's an awesome tool for connecting kids in this time of remote learning. Yeah, a ton of a ton of free tools. And, and I love what you're saying. Students are the experts at this. So I think what happens with projects like this sometimes is, you know, we, the teachers are probably more nervous about doing this than some of our students because we're not as aware of things. It's a great multimedia project where teachers, I think, can learn maybe even more than their students in some cases. So why don't we take a look at 
how Daniel and uh, his collaborator Ian podcast with their winning podcast, How My Town Found the Universe. So let's listen to how Daniel and Ian put this together and the different types of editing techniques they used. Again, as you are listening, what do you notice? And what podcast moves do you want your students to emulate? The place, a hilltop in New Jersey. The setting, giant antennas like monstrous eyes and ears, straining, watching, waiting. So radio astronomy was actually discovered in Holmdale. Just because Holmdale was a nice place with no radio interference, it's kind of a backward way for Holmdale to get into science, I guess, <laughs> by being open with no radio. <laughs> but I, I think that's why it happened. That's radio astronomer Robert Woodrow Wilson. He's a longtime resident of Holmdale, New Jersey, the same town that I live in. It's a small and quiet town. Nothing much ever happens here. We're mostly known for our beautiful parks and rolling farmlands. But our history is deep, and Dr. Wilson is here to tell you his part in shaping our town's history. Uh, Laura, anything that you notice when you were listening to this? Any, any really good moves to take away from? Uh, I mean, as everyone was pointing out, it was phenomenal nostalgia. Um, the old radio clip at the beginning has like a Twilight Zone vibe. Um, you can't really tell what you're listening to, which is what I love. So it's like the mystery that hooks you. Um, you know what kind of sense you're, you know, we know we're gonna, it's going to be about radio, but how how do we get there? And and, and who will they incorporate to tell us really um, what's going to happen? Um, and I think it's it's really interesting that this is their town history that these two students helped to um, kind of broadcast to the world. Yeah, it is. It's really a great listen. We took you through this process of creating a podcast, choosing a topic, uh, deciding on a format, the research outlining and then script writing phase. And then finally, the technical side of things, recording editing and publishing. So Laura, is there anything else that our teachers and students need to think about before they go about doing a podcast project? I really want to emphasize the importance of keeping it short <laughs> because, you know, I hope that a lot of teachers are encouraging their students to submit to it to this context, mostly because there's an authentic audience um, and there's a five minute limit. But also the last thing you want to do um, for a student's first foray into audio editing is to have them dealing with an unwieldy amount of audio. There's no way a student or an, an adult who's new to podcasting can work through hours of audio content. It's just overwhelming. So making a short, um, easily editable um, audio project, I think, can't be undersold here. Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree. I mean, you could t you could just kind of hear all of the work that was put into even those small little clips. Um, so you know, definitely don't bite off more than you can chew. But you know, it, I, I think it's really worth sort of taking the leap if you haven't done it before. Okay, so Laura, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, it was such a pleasure. All right, and uh, our webinars are produced by Rachel Manley and Callie Holterman. The video clips were edited by Callie Holterman and myself and for everybody here at the Learning Network. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.